<laughs> so welcome everybody um, on behalf of the South African Transactional Analysis Association. Welcome to this uh, third webinar in our series and particularly welcome to you Chitra. Um, we're looking forward to your um, learning with you about impasses. So over to you. Thank you, Karen, and a very warm welcome to all of you over here um, for this webinar. And this is my first webinar, so uh, especially on Zoom. So I'm quite positive that we're going to have some glitches, some challenges in, you know, me forgetting things here and there to uh, unmute, mute and all of that. And I'm going to take uh, Karen's support and help and all your support. In, uh, in case you can't hear me, in case something's not clarified, I've missed something, do come back and do call for uh, any kind of support that you may require as we walk along. And I think it, it was a very important uh, uh, beginning that you, uh, I mean, the very important message that you began with Karen, that you're recording, video recording this entire webinar, and that uh, we have the option of... Uh, posting it on the website or not because uh, I think in this particular uh, webinar on impasses I am going to invite some amount of sharing as we walk along and therefore uh, before we go into that I just thought we will warm up to each other and uh, introduce ourselves uh, a little bit at least just to get to know uh, something about you and why you're here as well as what kind of field of practice uh, as well as uh, how many years have you been with transaction analysis you know, uh, and anything else that you may want to add on before we proceed and I think uh, um, I will go last so that those of them who want to join us uh, then also have my introduction at the end so whoever is ready to share something about yourself, I'd be happy to hear from you. So we have Penny, we have Marguerite, and I'm, I'm quite sure, that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm quite uh, aware that I might not have all the pronunciation of your names the way you might want them to sound. So please let us know as to how you'd like to be called. But I'm going to anyway go for it and say we have Kirsty. Sharon, Karen, Rosemary with us, and Veronica. And Marguerite. And Marguerite, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Marguerite, would you like to begin? Yes. Your... So I'm in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I'm, I did my CTA in the end of 2009. I'm an organizational transactional analyst, so I work in organizations, you know, settings. Um, sorry, guys. <laughs> I have a dog problem. Um, I work in organizations with transactional analysis. Um, and I'm hoping to do, planning to do the TEW in January in India. Oh, that's lovely. So you're, yeah. you're the one who wrote to us. Yeah. You to to yes. That's the plan. Yes, nice to meet you. I'm just going Thank to you. sort my dogs out while you chat to the others quickly. Yeah, I have my dog doing these interruptions as well. And that's I fine. have a solution, but I don't. Shall I go next? Says I'm also in Cape Town. <laughs> um, so I'm Veronica. I originally did my first like 101 in about 2000 and um, I did quite a few sessions with Colin and Karen and then I sort of dropped off the TA world for a while um, using the skills but not actually being actively involved. So it's only in the last probably two or three years that I've really got back involved again. So I'm looking forward to all these opportunities to remind me deepen my knowledge and learn more. So I'm a coach and a facilitator, um, executives um, and organizational work mostly. And I find the TA is such a wonderful, has so many wonderful models, languages that I can use that people can really understand. So I'm here to learn more today. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Veronica. Let me go, because I'm also from Cape Town. <laughs> so we'll get all the Cape Town people. 
Um, yeah, my name's Penny and um, I'm a psychologist and I'm working currently at uh, Montrose Manor Eating Disorder Unit. I'm in a, in a clinic setting and uh, yeah, I have the privilege to run some groups on transactional analysis where we just do kind of basic concepts with the clients, but just like what, what uh, everyone else has said, I mean, it's just such a user-friendly approach. Um, I was introduced to it in my training about nine years ago. And so I have, have kind of stuck with it since then um, and attended various trainings, but I'm always ready to learn more. I wouldn't call myself a pure transactional analysis therapist, but um, uh, yeah, I love the approach and hoping to learn some more. So you've been using it for how many years? Uh, I know I'm aware that you mentioned clinical practice. Yes. Are you part of a TA training group or have you... No, I'm not. No, it's a, yeah. I am. Um, I haven't been, as I say, I haven't been uh, doing therapy completely with transactional analysis. But in the in the clinic, we've I've dived much more into it over the past two years. It's always used it to inform my thinking, you know. But I wouldn't say that I've actually um, been part of the the groups and so on over the years. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Morning. I'll follow. I'll follow suit if I may. Oh, you okay, sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. So are you going to... Is that Sharon? Yes, thank you, Chitra. Morning, yes. I thought I'd follow suit with all the Cape Townians. Um, I am in South Africa and often in, the, in Cape Town, um, but currently in the Karoo where I live, um, which is about 186 k's outside of Cape Town. Uh, lovely to be with you all this morning. I'm very excited to be learning about impasses. I've never done work around impasses, so it's really an exciting morning for me. Um, I have very little understanding of TA. Um, I did my first TA 101 with Karen, um, I think two years ago, and have been um, following all the online webinars and attending as much as I can. Um, I use quite a bit of TA in my emotional intelligence training and obviously a good, a good amount of the models in the coaching environment, uh, which is where I work. I'm a life and business coach working in the transformational arena. Um, so great to be on board this morning and to be learning um, alongside each and every one of you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I'll go next. Um, so my name's Kirsty. I'm from Cape Town. Uh, I work as a life coach and I'm in the process of launching some workshops in schools, um, working with young adults. I did my TA 101 in 2014, so I've just been trying to learn as much as I possibly can since then. Um, also very excited to learn about impasses because I, I haven't come across that yet. So a beginner with that, and I feel like I'm a beginner with TA actually, but um, yeah, I love it. It just makes so much sense to me. And every person I've, I've showed, presented it to has said the same thing. So yeah, excited. Lovely. So I'm seeing a lot of you have uh, entered TA and I have got a good grip with the one-on-one -on -one concepts and you're like excited to learn in passes. And now we have Rosemary from Chennai. Thank you. No, I can't hear you, Rosemary. Okay. You'll have to unmute. I am unmuted. Ah, now I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so I am not from Cape Town. I'm from Chennai, and uh, and um, so I'm also I'm fairly new to TA too. I did my TA 101 in 2014. Yes, and uh, since then I've been uh, part of a TA group here in Chennai, and um, I also take uh, webinars from Karen as part of her online webinar group. And uh, my journey so far has been very interesting, both professionally and personally. And I use TA a lot in, in the corporate trainings that I use, uh, that I um, give. And uh, for me, impasse has always been very, very interesting. More so because I have, I have used it personally on my areas where I have felt stuck. And I'm very curious to know how this impasse concept can be used in the field of education. And hence I'm here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. 
I'll have a very brief introduction because I know all of you except for you, Penny. So you might be wondering how I fit into the scene. Um, I'm a TSTA in the educational field. I did my 101 probably the same time as you, Veronica, around 2000. And I've done the journey uh, to become a, a, a trainer and a supervisor over the, over the years. Um, I do a lot of training and also work as a, as a coach and a facilitator. Karen, I've known you for quite some time now. In fact, from what I remember, we both did our TEW together. We were in Kerala doing our TEW in 2009, 10. 2009, I think. No, 2007. Something like that. And then Chitra and I both completed our final piece of um, qualification last year together in India, which was a great joy. Lovely. And um, as well as we are co-chairs of the IBOC, so we do interact quite a bit. Um, so I think I'll introduce myself to the group. Um, and I, I want to begin by saying that uh, I've, I've been with transactional analysis now for the past decade and a half. And uh, I've, uh, like, I think like what Karen, you mentioned, I completed my final piece last year, so I'm a, uh, I'm a teaching and supervising transactional analyst, psychotherapy from India, Bangalore. This is quite a green part of Bangalore where I stay, and I have my private practice also attached to my home, and I also have my groups that I run over here. Um, currently, I'm running about five groups, so I maintain quite a busy schedule. I also do some amount of coaching as well as uh, leadership training for corporates. I've had an extensive experience of over 25 years with corporates. I've been also, I mean, I think some of you mentioned how excited you've been with the transactional analysis concepts, how simple they are, how easy they are to use. And I think that's been my excitement for the past 15, 16 years now. And uh, I've loved this whole theory of impasses and how easy it is for us to uh, use this. I mean, there is an intra-psychic element to it as well as an interpersonal element to it. And uh, so I think for us, uh, uh, I mean, to walk through it, through this whole concept itself and see what possibilities this concept offers for all of us is what I'm looking at over the next hour and a half or a little less than that a little more than that yeah so shall we just go right in or do we just give any because there are about four people who are still pending Karen Chitra I think we go in um, if they do join late so be it they might have uh, had something else come up and explain yeah. So I'm just going to share screen and open out my presentation. Uh, I've done a combination of making a presentation of this concept. And I think Karen has already shared a handout that I have a one page handout with all of you, which perhaps you all can open out uh, when uh, we arrive at that particular place that I'll call for. You can even take a printout and keep that ready. Um, I'll go ahead and share the screen. And uh, so we'll go and dive right into this right now. So I'm only able to see a few of you. Let's see if I can see a few more of you. I think this is fine. Can you all see me clearly? Tetra, if you want to see other people who aren't visible, you just click the arrow going up or down and it's like, scrolls on a yeah. As sure, sure. Speaks, they will come up to be on the screen so even if you okay. can't see them and they speak they'll they'll pop up okay so i'm still getting used to it and perhaps that is my impasse right now <laughs> how can i be visible and and yet not be visible so let's let's just look at what that impasse is about later on so uh I think the time contracts that we will have, I have timed this presentation or this whole working with impasses for approximately 90 minutes to begin now. 
and we would have about 2015 to now that we've already we are on uh, 11.52, we have about 10 to 15 minutes for reflections, insights, feedback and questions. You can stop me at any point of time with your questions, but I prefer to also have those 10 minutes for questions so that we pause for those 10 minutes and we take the time to actually see what, what is it that we want to put back into the group. Let me know if I am audible and Karen, I'm going to ask you to be active in alerting me on these aspects. Is that all right? Sure. All good so far. Yes. I think what we've already done is we've done, uh, we've done this introduction. Uh, Karen, how can I move this, uh, the, the pictures or the uh, video onto the side of the screen? Just um, drop and drag it. You can get it to move in a, either all at the top or all at the side. So it will always be slightly over the left or the right side or the top or the bottom. So it's space with the, and that's the same for everybody else to drop and drag so that they can see enough of the slide. Sure. So I think we've done this bit where we've done our intros, you've talked about your field of practice. Many of you have talked about your specific expectations that you have. And from what I understand, and I want to just consolidate that, you have expectations to uh, really understand impasses. Some of you have talked about how you want to uh, apply it to yourselves and understand impasses uh, yourself through or some of those aspects of yourself through the lens of impasses. And perhaps what we will do is, in the course of the, uh, uh, you know, the time that we spend together, we'll bring in some amount of application, uh, perhaps even to a case example that I may have. Yeah. If you have any questions, just bring yourselves in at any point of time. Okay. Uh, yeah. So these are the references which you already have in your handout. Uh, I think one of the key res references for impasses is this book by Robert and Mary Goulding, Changing Lives Through Redecision Therapy, as well as there's an article, a, a TAJ article by Ken Mellard, 1980 on impasses. This article is also available on the internet if you Google, you know, for it. Mellard's article is available on the internet. Uh, Cornell and Landek's article is available if you are an ITA member and you can access it uh, via the SAGE, uh, you know, the, the website. Can I come Sorry. here and explain to people, Chitra, I emailed this handout um, just about five minutes before the webinar started. So you might want to just check your emails and you'll have a, a one pager with the diagram and the references. So shall we pause for a minute while y'all do that to check if y'all have the handout, you know, ready so you can even place it perhaps somewhere. It's a PDF, so it's easy to place and you may refer to it a little later as we walk along this whole presentation. Yeah, I've got it. You've got it? I think it might have been sent to Anne-Marie, if I'm correct, Karen. It would have been sent to Anne-Marie because that's the only email yeah. link I have. Yes, I'm not sure if she's actually forwarded on to me. Okay. Um, I might not have it. Is that okay? Will I, will I manage? That's okay. That's it's okay? Fine. I'll get it afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Shall I proceed? Yeah, I'm sorry. I can't. I had it open, but I can't access it now that... I've got the presentation on screen, so I'm not quite sure why I can't no, we get only it. require it much later, uh, Veronica. Fine. No problem, thank you. So when we actually do a small breakout session, it might be useful for you to have the handout. And even if you don't, it's not, it's not difficult because I'll go as slowly or as fast as you require for this presentation. So I'm just going to go into this next slide and I think uh, uh, just to reiterate the objectives I think is really to facilitate an understanding of impasses and I, I am hoping that you will be able to do a brief application of this concept to yourself 
and uh, if time permits i have a case example that i bring in which is a clinical example but it's simple enough so you can start uh, looking at how you can apply it in coaching perhaps and in other situations as well as uh, mentioned by all I think uh, when we look at impasses, it is uh, important to mention, uh, you know, a little bit about which school and which approach this particular concept belongs to. And we have, uh, I mean, we have two people who uh, who looked at moving a little away from the classical approach, which was proposed by Eric, Dr. Eric Byrne. And they are Robert and Mary Goulding. So Rob, the Goulding's, uh, and they were husband and wife, and we often refer to them as the Goulding's. And the Goulding's uh, did a lot of work with Fritz Perls. Fritz Perls is the uh, founder of this approach called the Gestalt approach, which some of you might have heard of. And... Uh, uh, the Gestalt approach is what they were quite inspired with and they, look, they explored with how they could integrate transactional analysis with Gestalt therapy and the Gestalt philosophy and the approach. And therefore what they, uh, the Gouldings looked at an amalgamation of Gestalt as well as transactional analysis. And uh, some of you mentioned that you've been through the PA one and uh, some of you also mentioned that you've been through some amount of uh, training with transactional analysis but not really been a part of the group. Um, so you might remember the whole theory of the life script. And the life script, uh, when we look at it, early influences that an individual goes through starts forming the personality of the individual. So early childhood experiences in, their, uh, in the early environment, those influences form the blueprint of the personality. And in transactional analysis, we look at it as the life script. So Robert and ba Mary Goulding looked at how in the early life of individuals, certain script decisions are formed through the kind of parenting and the kind of environmental influences that a little that a person encounters early in life. So these early decisions, some of which go against the healthy against a healthy organism. Some of them go against an mind and body and the psyche of the individual. So some of it goes against the you know, the, uh, when we look at the psyche, when we look at even, uh, you know, some of it somatically or some of it experience of the body or the health of the individual or the organism, we are, sometimes look at some thoughts which are, uh, which are unhealthy that an individual can, uh, you know, gather from the environment and form certain decisions. So these early decisions are what Robert and Mary Goulding's help an individual or facilitated an individual to explore with. And therefore, what they looked at is, since they looked at early decisions, they looked at their therapy as re-decision therapy. So in their work, when they worked with individuals, and a lot of their work they did in groups, so in their, in their work, they would often invite the client who they were working with to speak about a difficulty or an issue that they were going through in life. And they invited them or facilitated them, facilitated them to explore with that issue enough to arrive at what were those early decisions that the person was experiencing or had rubber banded back to and they facilitated interventions to help the clients 
in their redecisions and therefore this name redecision therapy and when we look at the whole concept of impasses they first began through the thinking of robert and mary building the buildings in their work with redecision therapy so there is an article injunctions and redecisions which is a taj article a transactional analysis journal article that first was it first proposed the work with injunctions and with redecision therapy and with impasses any questions any any uh, anything that you want to know more of before we proceed so before we actually go into what impasses are i invite you just for a few minutes 2 to 3 minutes to think and make a note of the following i think somebody has joined us karen shall i just continue just continue um chitra sure sure so just think of a recent conflict or a perpetual difficulty that you face something small something big something that you find that you continue to experience some stuckness with any kind of a conflict any kind of aspect of your life that you face where you experience stuckness and i invite you to make a note of it i i'm also uh, to see i mean just check if there are any internal dialogues that you hear when you experience this particular conflict any noise in the head any kind of internal dialogues that persist when you encounter this particular conflict and while you're doing that i'm just going to welcome sharon who i see over here who's just joined in hi sharon you'll have to unmute yourself just to say a hi to the group we've already begun we've just about begun okay and my name is chitra and i'm facilitating this webinar and i'm inviting you to reflect on this particular conflict and just keep this in your radar as and when the concept is being covered so i'm just checking with you were each of you able to think of some conflict and especially those who haven't thought of any perhaps you can just give us a sound so i'm assuming that everybody thought of some kind of conflict that you were facing okay i mean has anybody heard of this term called impasses yeah 
And if so, what have you heard? Petra, I stand corrected, but my, my impression of an impasse, another word would be a kind of stuckness, really. Uh, um, a kind of conflict inside where one doesn't really know which way and it kind of feels like the energy leaves the building where uh, the way forward isn't clear. That's kind of my, my impression. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the key words that I heard over here is stuckness and the way forward is not visible. Yeah, and did you say something else so I can just make a note? Stuckness, you said, and... Um, yeah, just a sense of the, the way forward isn't clear and uh, how to get out of it also isn't clear. Absolutely. And, um, and it, it all kind of sometimes, I, for me, what I've learned is when I find myself at an impasse, that actually breakthrough is close with the client, but they just don't see it. And I, and I think you've just hit the nail on the head because um, way, the way forward isn't clear, getting out isn't clear, and sometimes what you see in a client is that, that stuckness sometimes also is not clear. Mm. Often, I might not even know that I'm stuck. Yes. I might, even know, I might not even know that this is something that I'm conflicted about. And I just am there. I mean, it's almost like, um, but it, it, it sometimes is at a very existential level. I just feel terribly stuck in a particular situation. Mm. And yeah, so, and I also like what you said about there seems to be like two places that are, uh, you know, I seem to be stuck in between something. Mm. Yeah. So, any other thoughts that anybody has? Um, Chitra, I feel, sorry. Yes, Rosemary. Um, for me, stuckness, stuckness is the first word that comes in when I hear impasse. And I also feel that it is the conflict that one has between the wants and the can'ts. I -hmm. want certain things to be happening in certain way, but mm -hmm. I also in my head feel I can't or I may not, or those voices that come in uh, preventing you from achieving your wants. Absolutely. So I, I, I really want something so badly and I'm just not able to. I just can't do it. I just can't. Yes. Yeah. So that's the stuckness. Any other? I also I picked this one. I think Penny, you said, was it Penny? You, you mentioned energy and that um, for me is quite significant in stuckness is that there seems to be a lot of energy spent on the, the impasse and the inability to move and that actually saps energy so for me that's quite significant in this this whole thing is the sapping of energy that the impasse creates that we create for ourselves by being stuck seems as if you're doing nothing but it takes a lot of energy so you know and this is so important <clears throat> so you experience it like as if there's this absolute dip in energy that saps your energy it seems like almost that, you know, it's, it's a place where you cannot move yourself out or you cannot harness some energy from within to get yourself out of that situation. Beautiful. Um, and I think I'd like to share what Cornell and Landig 3, in their article in 2003, uh, they mentioned as an impasse. And I really, I really like what they've talked about as an impossible road or a blind alley. And allowing no escape. It seems like as if all of us have certain conflicts that we get stuck with. And uh, at that point when we're really stuck in that particular situation or that particular aspect that we're stuck about, it seems like as if there is no escape that is possible. Yeah, any questions, any thoughts as we move on? So in transactional analysis, we look at this as, and, and these are some of the examples of conflicting situations, which I just thought I'd share with you. You know, I really want to slow down, but I keep on taking new projects. I want to speak up, but there's a constriction in my throat. 
And this is something that I had with a client. I land on this dream job, but I fall off a balcony and break my leg. And for some people, I really be, want to enter a group or be a part of the group, but then I have a lot of anxiety. And for some others, it's constant comparison of myself with others. Then there's this other thing about, I want to complete my assignment, but there's this noise that goes off saying, better, 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 better. Perhaps for the past three, four days, I kept looking at what else can I change in this presentation. Yeah. I keep helping others in the hope that I'll be accepted. And this is a classic one, which I've, I've worked with many clients on this. I keep trying different things to lose weight but without too much success. So many of you might have been familiar with people who've presented them in coaching and therapy and situations, a friend, a family member, or you might have experienced any of these conflicts. And so just let's keep that in the fray and go through the rest. Yeah. And any thoughts or anything before we proceed? So according to the Gouldings, I think an impasse is a stuck place, and many of you mentioned this, between two opposing forces. And I think this is a very important part of the definition. The part where you look at two opposing forces. Like it's, it's like almost that there are two aspects of something and you're being, it's being pulled apart. And the stuckness is really right there in between those two opposing forces. And in transactional analysis, we look at these two opposing fo forces as two parts of ourselves and therefore two ego states. So you have the here and now thinking of the adult really experiencing that stuckness. And the two opposing forces are really the top dog and the underdogs. And the parent and the child. One part of us really being that part which is parent and all the borrowed parts and all the parts that are from external influences. And the other part really which is a part of us which has its own relics of early experiences. And that part also which wants stuff for ourselves. And I like what you said uh, earlier, Penny. You, you talked about how... The stuckness, I want something, but I'm not, I, I'm not sure if it was Penny or Rosemary or even Marguerite, I'm not sure. One of you talked about how I want something, I think, and I can't get it. I think that was Rosemary who talked about it. I, there's almost a voice saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. And that's really that part, that two parts of us which constantly go against each other part that really says the shoulds and not should nots and the part that really says I want all of this but I just can't seem to do it for myself and just take back and often they involve a lot of those noises in the head those voices and sometimes even the, the very same dialogue that one of the parent figures impressed upon us when you were small so far, so good. Any thoughts, any questions? Well, I'm not able to see most of you. I can see three of you over here. But I'm just going with, uh, you know, the belief that if any of you want to stop and y'all are going to talk, then you will appear on the screen. So I'm just going to proceed. And now I'm just inviting you to take a moment and see how this is fitting into your own situation. Your own conflicting situation. What's that part which belongs to the P and what's that part that belongs to what you want?
so if i am proceeding uh, you know to explain the types of impasses but before that if any of you have any thoughts or any questions or anything to share i'm just going to give it 30 seconds for us to have that time um chitra yes uh, margaret it it came through quite clearly on your previous slide with the the sentences that you gave us i want to speak but i feel a constriction in my throat etc that sure. this is that that it's very those you know, you know you could actually attach the drivers to those sentences quite easily oh yes so um yeah. Yeah, I wonder are you going to talk about drivers yes. in relation to so, cool. I'm just yeah. going to shortly. Hmm. That's just time coming time through time. for me quite significantly that the you know that uh, the impact that the driver can have and does have on an impasse. Yeah. yeah I'm getting there very very shortly. Great. Thanks thanks for that question because I was all, almost wondering if there were any impasses about asking questions <laughs> yeah um i think there's a bit of sense the sort of an i'm i don't know if the others are feeling this but it's kind of when can i chip in it doesn't feel quite as natural as when you're in a group and you just sort of speak and yeah yeah natural. we're all we're all bit busy muting ourselves and then coming on and oh can i come on now so we we kind of need to relax and start conversing a bit here yeah and i think it will help for me to share my own impasse um my impasse is that i'm quite terrible at doing non interactive sessions <laughs> so this whole one way traffic is you know, doesn't work for me at all <laughs> and i feel i feel awkward and i feel stuck and i wonder if you're getting it so i'm glad you clarified this madhurit because it's absolutely fine for you to come in at any point of time there is no set agenda we can go as far as uh, you know as far and deep and as much as we want to go and i think that the let me uh, hand over the baton to the group and you can come in at any point of time Okay. So I you know sometimes I've done a teach for 250 people I did a particular session of 3 hours of work with the uh, uh, you know psychiatric and psychotherapy conference and you'd be surprised to know that was interactive Yeah yeah so I I don't uh, enjoy doing this one way teaches so do come in whenever Uh, so i'll i'll uh, move to the next slide and we can always go back and forth if required um so what we're going to look at is the three types of impasses and now that we know that it's between ego states uh i'm going to start with the this is what goulding's put together in the concept and we'll see how we can start understanding conflicts through impasses uh here we are looking at the intra psychic impasses so the type one and they looked at three different types of impasses just before we go further uh they used the word degrees first degree impasse second degree impasse third degree impasse and even in my handout i've mentioned it uh later on the they changed the word degree to types only because it indicated this whole thing about severity of the impasse mm. it is not necessarily uh, you know type 3 is not necessarily more severe or less severe than type 2 or type 1 so this it does not indicate any level of severity it just talks about the type of impasse mm. uh, you know for instance in first degree second degree and third degree games you have you know the third degree games which indicate a much higher level of severity yeah. so i have now replaced the word degrees with types because that's what we use today uh so the type 1 impasse and then this is what you asked about uh, margaret yeah. is between the parent ego state and the child ego state 
So I'm not sure, uh, at the 101, we usually look at only PAC as a model, but as we go into advanced TA training, we look at taking this a little deeper into uh, not just the P2, A2, and C2, this is the kind of nomenclature that we use to look at the ego state model. Uh, from P2, A2, C2, we also have P1, A1, and C1, and P0, A0, and C0. So I'll clarify what each of those mean uh, as we proceed. So the type one impasse is the impasse between the parent ego state and the child ego state. And it involves, whereas the type two impasse involves a, the impasse between the P1 and the C1, which is within the child ego state. I will be explaining this further. I'm just opening out the diagrams right now. And the type three impasse is between the free child and the adapted child. Now the type one impasse is between the counter injunctions. They involve the counter injunctions and which is why you will have the noise in the head. The actual dialogue that was mentioned by the parent, the parent and parent figures. So my father, for instance, if he were to say, do it quickly. and I want to slow down, then I'm hearing when I'm taking it slow and easy, sometimes I'm hearing that noise in my head saying, come on, go fast, do it quickly. Don't, don't be so slow, don't be lazy. So these are the kind of voices that sometimes each of us can hear in our heads, depending on the, on the impasse or on the particular situation that we are in. Counter injunctions are those verbal messages that were given to us by parent and parent figures. And which is why the impasse is carried via language. And the type one impasse is usually set up when language is already being learned by the little child. So it's a little later in childhood, often around the age of five years or six years old, when a lot of, when parenting involves a lot of do's and don'ts and clear instructions as to what works and what doesn't in, in an environment. So far, so good. Any questions? No. Not yet, but that's great. We can come back to it if there are any further questions. The type two impasse. Now P1 in transactional analysis, we look at within the child ego state. Now this is not something that was messages that were verbally instructed by parents, but P1 messages are those messages that the child sensed or the, the child imagined or fantasized that was what the parents wanted from the child. So P1 is called the fantasized parent and they are non-verbal aspects of what the child imagined the parents wanted from the child, from the growing child. And some of them are the injunctions. So they're based on the injunctions. And in the, even in the TA 101 and thereafter, we might remember 
The injunctions are all those non-verbal don't messages that the child picked up from the environment. And Goulding and Goulding's are the ones who coined 12 injunctions. So don't be close, don't belong, sometimes don't exist, don't be important, don't think, don't feel what you're feeling. Uh -huh. Don't be a child. Don't enjoy life. And the type 2 impulses are enco encoded in feelings. So let me give you an example over here. I don't know if you look at... Uh, I want to really be part of this group. I shared a particular slide earlier. I really want to be a part of this group. But I experience a lot of anxiety. If you look at the injunction, any idea what this injunction would be? I want to be a part of this group, but then I experience anxiety. Don't have feelings. Don't worry. Pardon? Perhaps it's don't, don't, don't have feelings. Don't have feelings? Don't any have an opinion. opinion. Or maybe, maybe don't belong. Don't belong, absolutely. So don't feel, don't belong. And don't be close also perhaps. Don't belong is significant in this injunction. So the person really wants to belong. And that anxiety is what it's encoded in. That feeling of anxiety. So this person is really looking at belonging and when they enter a party, when this person enters a party or a particular gathering, there are a group of people and the, the client starts approaching this group and then has experiences this whole lot of anxiety, which prevents I and mean, which really throws up in the moment that stuckness and is unable to really just freely go and belong. I'm bringing it back to the definition that we looked at, that one of the group members brought in, where you talked about, I really want to do something, but I can't. So here, the injunction prevents that individual from doing naturally what the natural child wants and getting stuck in that anxiety. Are we okay with this so far? So Chitra, the, the desire to belong to the group, for example, in this example, is coming from A2. So it's in the here and now, a, dec a decision, I really want to do this, but then the stuckness comes from the impasse in the, in the C2. It's so, uh, no, uh, Karen, in this case, we look at it as a type 2 impasse no. because it involves the injunction. They hit the injunction. So the uh, C1 is the somatic child or the child which really is very similar to the free child. In our body, we really, the C1 really wants to live, wants to, you know, go ahead and do things. So uh, the wanting to belong in this case will actually come from the C1. Okay. Yeah. But the P1 is where the stuck, that stops or the dialogue is you know, not just the dialogue that uh, the fantasized parents where you don't belong here can prevent the person from just freely going and belonging. And that's where the injunction uh -huh. is located. Okay. Yeah. The A1 here, we can have some possibilities. Sorry. Can I just, yes. you know, just try and clarify. Yes. So, um, uh, how... Mm -hmm. So the, the counter injunction in type um, one impasse, that would be actually a kind of verbal, there would be quite a verbal message here, whereas the, the differences in P1 in the type two impasse is more a uh, imagined or non-verbal impression that the child's received. Absolutely. That's the difference. So, yes. so, could be, so, so there's this idea of don't belong, uh, mm -hmm. whereas potentially in the type one impasse, a parent literally would be saying things of like, you don't belong here or like, or something like that. Whereas in the type two, 
the parents might just not be welcoming the child into the space and ignoring them, they're depressed or... Absolutely. Right? Okay. Yes, absolutely. So I'll give you an example. It's part of my kids example uh, with this client who really uh, was born 12 years after her brother. So the table conversations were all adult conversations. So there was no verbal messages saying that you don't belong with us. Yes. But from the time she was really almost from the time she was born, and especially as she grew, she learned that she could she was really not a part of the three adults. I mean, she had a her brother who was much older and the two parents sitting at the table, and she felt really small and left out. Mm. So it's at the non-verbal level that she got a sense of not really feeling a part of. And so, also it will involve some amount of body language from the parents sometimes. Yeah. So, so those messages, Chitra, you're saying come in a lot earlier. They can come in before the whole verb. Okay, so that can happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, it, I mean, typically injunctions are set up before the age of three. They are yeah. pre-verbal and pre-cognitive. Yeah. And that's why they involve a lot of feelings. So, the child really feels put down, pushed away, you know, uh, not feeling a part of, not important. So, non-verbally, it's a sense, it's a feeling that they're left with. You know, and that feeling is often... I think they repressed so much that they're not in contact with that feeling. Yeah. And each time a person encounters a similar situation, the, the individual yeah. rubber bands right back into that old place and that feelings resurfaces and that injunction gets reinforced and that's how the script decision also is reinforced. First. And that whole intrapsychic loop then gets strengthened. Uh, Chitra, I have a question here to carry forward with what Karen asked you. Um, so th this is exactly what what Karen asked uh, is what I want to ask again because I wasn't clear at that point in time. Because usually what I, the logical things that I need for myself or the client needs or the examples that you cited are um, and are they coming from the A2? Are they, they are coming from the adult ego state because me wanting to slow down, me wanting to belong to the group that I am in are reasonable, logical, adult, here and now decisions that I want for myself. Um, but then type 2 impasse will prevent the adult ego state from implementing those wants by listening to uh, the conflict between the P1 and C1. Yeah. Is, that, is my understanding correct? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you have to look at it in another way. Yes, of course, the adult. I mean, right now, I'm assuming all of us are in the A2. Because we are all thinking, we are all processing information. We are fully in the A2. Let's just hypothetically say that one of us really wants to ask a question and be a part of this whole webinar. But then there is, you know, I, I might, exp you know, as a group member, my, if I'm experiencing anxiety, I'm not in my thinking adult. I'm not in the A2 at all. Okay. Yeah, so there's that part of me that really, that child which should have really felt very belonged, which was not given that space, or which, didn't re which really didn't have that space. And so this, I, the C1 is where, you know, at a very, very early age, it's like that, it's that, that part of us which really wants to just spread our arm, ha, arms out and just run in the field. But then a look from the mom or dad prevented us from just doing that. Natural. Okay. I get As it. As far as might just ball its head off. But repeated, uh, you know, uh, uh, conditioning in terms of a look or a disapproval from the parents, it's at a non-verbal level. Then uh, invites the child 
or not just invites, prevents, prohibits the child from that free expression. So therefore, we look at the stuck, the C1 really wanting to open its arm out and feel, but then that feeling is, I mean, that whole experience is prevented by a non-verbal disapproving message that the child senses or picks up from the environment and therefore becomes a prohibition or an injunction. And therefore, it's, in, it's encoded in those feelings of anxiety or, or those feelings of sometimes even anger, rebellion, the rackety feelings it's encoded in that prevents a child from taking it ahead. I get it. Thank you. It's, so for me, it was seemingly adult. All the decisions that I want to make were seemingly adult. But then, yes, it is coming from the free child that is being prohibited and hence not the adult, in fact. So uh, yeah. let me also clarify. Uh, when the work is being done, when interventions are being made, often it's brought back into the A2. Mm -hmm. I get it. Thank work you. sometimes is done in an old place, uh, and, and I'll talk about how this application happens. Uh, sometimes the, the client is regressed to an old place. Sometimes you can even work in the here and now. But it's brought back to the adult with uh, taking it back only after the, the person no, has no, 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 no. rented all those feelings that they didn't have this place. I think somebody's asking a question. question. Yes. Yes. Is there a question? There a question? Chitra, you are Chitra, echoing. echoing. I'm echoing now. Yeah. Is it okay now? It's okay. okay. Uh, I'll bring it maybe with examples. It will uh, get a little more strengthened. The type 3 impasse is what we will go to now. When the Gouldings actually put together type, the type 3 impasse, they looked at the free child and the adapted child. So I want to really be free and I start adapting to the environment. It looks quite similar to the type 2 impasse. The only difference is it's based on very early dynamics. Some of it is even prenatal with the type 3 impasse. And it's self pitted against self. So before we go further, I want to share with you Ken Miller's model. Because what he did was the type 3 impasse, he bought, brought in something very relevant. Uh, rather than bringing the functional modes of free child and adapted child, Miller now saw value in keeping it at the structural model. This is called the structural, second order structure and third order structural model of ego states. Ken Miller brought in this model. So in this model, you'll see that the Third type three impasse, and I've expanded the C one over here, over here into you know where you can see it on the right hand side, where the C one is what has the P zero, A zero, and C zero, and the stuckness is between the P zero and C zero. So the Messages oh, over here sorry. are... Yeah, sorry, um, yes. I'm getting a little bit confused about... I'm, I don't really understand the P0 now. Um, those are numbers are getting me a little bit confused. Yeah, so. Yeah. so I'll just so, explain this whole model now. So okay, P2, thank you. A2 yeah. and C2, we are, are we clear about the P2, A2 and C2? Okay. So okay. The is really, uh, you know, what you did with the 101... The parent ego state with all its interjections, the verbal messages is the P2. Yeah. The child ego state as a whole from the age of say zero to six and even thereafter 
and all those uh, experiences, thoughts, feelings that we ex we experienced while growing up as a C two. Yeah. The A two is the adult and the here and now. Yeah. Now the P one, A one, and C one is what I'm going to explain next. P1 is where, where you have the fantasized parent, the non-verbal aspects of what parents communicated very, very early in life. The P1 yeah. and C1, non-verbally. Sometimes it was just what the child saw or experienced with its parent figures or in an environment and got a sense of what injunctions, those don't messages or those prohibitions, those are located in the P1. Mm. The A1 is the little professor. The A1 is also the intuitive part of us, which is a rudimentary adult. And the C1 is that part of us, which is called the somatic child. Mm. That part which really is uh, the early, very early childhood which has that part of our body which really wants uh, <coughs> at the age of two, of two years, the child wants to crawl, the child wants you know, to be held, the child wants to be hugged. At the age of uh, six months, it wants to be hugged. All that is C1. Are we okay with the... Uh, and, and that's where we looked at the type two impasse. Now we're going into the type three impasse. And here you have really even prenatal, right from birth. So the, the newly conceived child, and the newborn child is looked at as a C0. And here you have experiences that the little infant has with significant others which we look at as the P0 and just think about a little infant really wants the biological needs to be met right from conception and now any trauma that occurs especially very very early in life is what can be looked at as a type 3 impasse I want to live. I want to be fed. I want to be dry. I want to be loved. I want to be held. And just those basic needs. And when the child experiences these needs that are not adequately met, those levels of stuckness is what we look at at the type 3 level. So, for instance, I've had clients right from birth, life is getting threatened. So, if I have clients who've told me I had a heart attack or I had heart problems, congenital heart problems, or I had a, had a heart attack at the age of four, at the age of five, it indicates to me that there are type three impasses. So, especially at the existential level, I, 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 even if you've done the 101, you'll remember this injunction called the don't exist or don't live injunction. This indicates a type 3 impasse. Petra, can and I ask a question, Craig? Well, yes, of course. I've, I've been involved in quite a lot of humanitarian work and I'm just thinking of children born into conflict zones and that kind of thing. Would these kind of impasses be... Quite know, possible. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's no verbal component, there is no feelings. Yeah. Uh, often it is just the way they are. So I've had, for instance, a client who'd had, who had excruciating headaches excruciating pain and he would get these headaches without any trigger, without any cause. He's got himself completely checked. So it appeared to me as if there was something that happened very early in life that, uh, and it was a part of the birth process. 
and also it was uh, when he went back and checked there was an attempt to abort the child and he survived it mm -hmm. so therefore uh, interventions were about health and life mm -hmm. sure. so in working with the type 3 impasse we really look at what can really uh, you know uh, invite the client to to live mm -hmm. and to really take care of just to be and to love myself just as I am. Mm. Thank you. And my case example, I, I'm not sure how much time I would have for the case example, but that really looks at all these three types of impasses that manifested in the course of therapy. All. And sometimes you might have in one particular stuckness, you might have all three impasses that manifest. And when we look at change, we're looking at thinking, feeling, and behavior. And sometimes when we're looking at change, we're just looking at just the therapeutic relationship. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, You're just saying, if, so effectively, the client can be experiencing all three impasses in their stuckness. So would one then, as you say, just start to deal with one of them? And, or do you try and deal with it all together? So taking them sort of more through a sort of staged approach. That's yeah. what I'm... Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a lovely question because um, if I locate a type 3 impasse, I also know the therapeutic relationships. And the, the relationship itself forms part of the healing, uh, the, the healing space, it is, or the container. It provides that healing container for the client to really start finding himself and his own will to live fully, will to be healthy. So I think uh, that's something that the uh, relationship itself focuses on, as well as certain inter interventions which would focus on, especially visualizations. Also chair work of self with self. Because I, I'm thinking in terms also, Future, because being I'm a coach, I'm not a therapist. So is there a point at which, you know, certain things you can say, okay, well, this is where you're stuck now. We can help you move forward. But it sounds like a lot of this that you do have to go back to re-decision. Re do you think that sits in the realm of coaching or therapy or can it sit in both? Um, so uh, while uh, the Goulding started this off as a very intra-psychic model, I think how uh, I look at it quite differently, and I'm glad you asked this question, Veronica. So um, I look at it as a model that you can keep in your mind as something where you can start seeing as to what impasses are getting thrown up, and then uh, or, 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 or what's actually getting presented in therapy or in coaching, some of it involves significant amounts of therapy, especially at the type 3 level. Yeah. Uh, some of it involves redecision work, sometimes regressive work. But often work can also be done in the here and now. So uh, just to give you an example, if somebody is looking at uh, belonging as an issue, uh, then even working in the uh, area of coaching with uh, how uh, interventions can be focused on working in the here and now itself mm. sometimes helps in having them making their own movements. How they belong with the, in the coaching relationship itself often, uh, you know, can look at the, uh, you know uh, the coach can look at what can be done over here. But yes, there are, there are some uh, some of it uh, uh, where. I would say that working with some old place and working with re-experiencing some of those old traumas uh, really significantly facilitates the Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Yes, of course. Uh, there's something in the type 3 empire, so just uh, maybe you can expand on it where you said it's the self pitted against the self. Yes. I just, some things, I, I don't know what to ask. I just don't quite get yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when I say, uh, when I say self-pitted against self, 
for instance uh, uh, you know it can be like what you brought in very uh, when you're working with high touch areas or when you're working with clients who have had a suicide as uh, you know the, you know part of their intake that you see so it is self i mean it's almost like i want to live but then a part of me just uh, condemns me okay because that's what i have learned I, you know i'm i'm really unworthy of even life so that's what you're working with uh let me give you an example i worked with this client who had uh, a brain tumor uh, which began at the age of 8 he was referred to me by a neurologist for therapy and every 2 years they had to do surgery to uh, work on the tumor so uh, you know in one of the sessions uh, i invited him to do a two chair work uh, where he put the tumor on the other chair Hmm. this is really a part of himself which wants to live and which wants uh, health and the other part of the chair which he has this tumor which can be so annoying and so painful and he had this face which had gone out of shape because of these tumors hmm. um, and he had a lot of anger with the tumor and when he put the tumor on the chair he was fully effusive in his uh, in expressing his anger and how he hated it and he had this he loathed this part of himself mm. and and in the course of this work when he moved to the other chair the tumor actually said uh, you know how awful he felt and how alone he felt and uh, how not a part of anybody he felt mm. not even a part of himself and what actually came up was fantastic because he said i just want to be a part i just want you know you to accept me and everybody else to accept me and uh, when he moved to this other chair he actually broke down and he said oh god this i really feel sorry for this part of me which feels so unloved so what he actually got in contact with is a part of him which felt unloved which mm. manifested this way mm. that was very powerful and and it's really surprising because i got repeated mails from him saying that Well, the tumor stopped. Sorry, the tumor stopped growing. Wow! And of course, you would have also looked at because, and and this is a classic example. In the A two house, am I echoing again? Yes, yes. So uh, you know when he brought back this, and that's where the redecision happened in the A zero. but we brought it back to the a2 where he decided i'm going to really look at what i can do to love and accept myself and did, did that get clarified penny i can't hear you penny can you answer to yourself yeah and me sorry <laughs> So that's where a lot of the work I can imagine happens in psychosomatic illnesses. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I think also any loss of life, any uh, any uh, I I completely agree with you because mm. somatic is really what the C1 is. Mm. And at the soma at the level of really life and uh, the body is where a person experiences the challenge. Mm. Thanks. Any other questions or can I proceed? I'll wait for a 30 second before I proceed. I'll just proceed and see if you have any further questions. I'm also realizing for those who've done the TA 101, perhaps this might sound a little complex for you. i'm looking at how best i can simplify it uh, however the impasses are these three but even for you to look at the type 1 impasse in your coaching work and to see how is it that you can work with counter injunctions that might be useful karen you have any thinking around that yes i think you you right teacher i guess many of us are looking at our um scope of work being in the developmental work in terms of learning and training and coaching and making the kind of connections and i think absolutely 
Um, in coaching, we can work with the type one impulses. Um, and I think what you said a bit earlier on, if there's deep trauma and there needs to be regression, that's therapy. But we can sometimes help people to work with this in the here and now because it isn't overwhelming and they can still, particularly within the context of the, the coaching relationship, um, make new meaning. Um, I sometimes conceptualize it with like layers of an onion and right at the middle are the script beliefs, and, uh, the script decisions, the beliefs, and then the behaviors. And in developmental work, we start from the outside towards the inside, not that we, but, and therapy starts at the inside going outwards. And even if we only work on the outside as it were, it can filter through to those really deep decisions as long as the, the work stays in the here and now. And I think I, I like the way you put it, uh, Karen, because I think the work can be done interpersonally yeah. and not necessarily yeah. intrapsychically, because intrapsychic would belong to the realm of therapy. And I'm glad that we've established this boundary between psychotherapy and coaching. Uh, and, you know, I, I also see that if there is any kind of significant trauma or difficulty, then a referral to a therapist might also be important, you know, keeping the ethical aspects in mind. Absolutely. So I'm just going to uh, go to the next part. And I think this diagram is also there in the handout. So um, uh, what I think we'll do is I, I've shared some client examples, so we will not have time to do any other client work. Uh, so you have a choice. I think I'll put it back to the group. Uh, and, and those of you who really think that we can, you can share your own example in groups of two or three, we could do that, or you could work with a client example. But we are sitting at uh, one o'clock already. What's your call, Karen? Um, I think it might be quite nice for people to work in, in smaller groups. Okay, with their own example. Yeah. All right. So I think we'll just do that and not really go into a therapy example. Is that all right? So let's just uh, uh, look at a breakout session. I'm, uh, and Karen, you'll have to help me with that uh, for about uh, five minutes. Is that all right? How many of us are there right now? Nine of us? Nine of you? I'm, I've created four breakout rooms. Um, I'm not sure if everyone is seeing it on the screen at the moment. No. So there's one, two, three, four. So they're going to be two groups of three and one group of two. And Chicho, you'll be in a room on your own because you won't want to interact. You want to stay no. in your role as facilitator. I'm going so to... I might just... I might just uh, so we'll, we'll take five minutes. Is that all right? No, we'll take six minutes. Okay. Because two groups of... Um, three. Three. So we'll take about, um, it's right now one o'clock in my clock. Mm -hmm. about, yeah. So we'll take time till about uh, one eight or so. Is that all right? Okay. So it's 9.30 for us in South Africa. Uh, so eight minutes, 9, um, 36, 38, 9.38. Great. I will click um, open all rooms. You will get an invitation to uh, accept the invitation and then you'll find yourself on a screen with a few people. Uh, and I will join one of the rooms because as the facilitator, I can't put myself in a room, but I can join a room. It will all become clear. Uh, are, we clear of, are we clear of what we're going to do in the breakout rooms? So what I was saying is that your own conflict, I think you might have some understanding as to what type of impasse you see. And you can share that in the groups of two or three. So you're connecting your own conflicting situation with impasses and only share how much and how, how far you're willing to share. Okay, great, here we go. And or even any insights that you may have with what, whatever you have, uh, you know, gathered so far. Is that okay? You might want to stop sharing your screen, Chitra. 
and then yeah, yeah. people will be able to access their email with the diagram as well. Yes, yes. Karen, are you here? I'm hearing you. So somewhere you're gonna see a stop sharing screen there. Great. Okay. So, so what's I will ask you one question. So after this, we will go into just some reflections and I'll only do one slide on application of this. Sure. I'm not doing the client example. We won't have that kind of time. Is that yeah. okay? Perfect. All right. Great. I'm going to join one of the rooms to be part of the, sure. the team and leave you some space to breathe. Sure. Sure. All good. Sure. Thank you.